Okay, time for a bit of a reality check. Time for some perspective. Now, this is partly me holding myself to account. A lot of the videos and podcasts I do are quick fire responses to things happening in the news in which I try as best I can to put them in a broader context. But a lot of comment recently in the news has obviously focused on Partygate, uh, Boris Johnson, the whole Boris Johnson drama. I've added in my two cents. I've tried to put it in a broader context, that kind of thing. But with COVID, and bear in mind, we suffered a gravest national catastrophe since World War II. Over 200,000 of our fellow citizens died. And um, that national catastrophe we went through, we've heard a lot about the role of Boris Johnson's government and their terrible failures. And it's important to keep holding them to account uh, for what they did. The danger is Johnson becomes a fall guy. You know, he's been discarded, thrown out now. Um, humiliated, all the rest of it, although he'll continue to make vast sums of money uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, but, you know, the Tories now, the people who put him in power, the Conservatives who made sure he became Prime Minister, they'll wash their hands of him and they'll just attribute or blame for everything that went wrong onto him. But that's not what happened. It's so important we talk about this. This week, David Cameron, our former Prime Minister, and George Osborne, our former Chancellor of the Exchequer, were interrogated at the COVID inquiry. Now, in these 13, over 13 long, dark, awful years of Conservative rule, it remains my view that they are the biggest villains of the last 13 years. The focus on Johnson often is because of his vulgarity, his style. And a lot of comment on British politics is just that. It's about style rather than content, substance, and so on. It was David Cameron and George Osborne who ripped up the social fabric of this country and left us brutally exposed to an external shock like the COVID pandemic. You can also add in all the political turmoil that we've had um, as a consequence of the terrible damage that they inflicted on this country. Now, that makes it such a travesty that if you take David Cameron, for example, he was interrogated for a couple of hours, when actually what David Cameron and George Osborne did to the country and how they left us exposed, that should be weeks of focus by the COVID inquiry. Now, let's just start by hearing from David Cameron. D do you accept, Mr Cameron, that the health budgets over the time of your government were inadequate and led to a depletion in its ability to provide an adequate service? Um, I, I don't accept that, um, neither on a sort of big picture level or yes. on a small picture level. I mean, the big picture level, I don't think you can separate the decision and the necessity of getting the budget deficit down and having a, a, a reasonable debt to GDP ratio so you can cope with future crises. I don't think you can separate that from um, the funding of the health service or indeed anything else. Oof, there he is, the unrepentant so-and-so. Uh, George Osborne, who I actually find more offensive. Um, let's just hear briefly from him because I literally cannot stand to hear um, vast sums of comment from that guy. Do you agree, Mr Osborne, that by the time COVID-19 hit, the consequences of austerity were a depleted health and social care capacity and rising inequality in the United Kingdom? Most certainly not. I completely reject that. Now, it's interesting because, you know, if I were to ever advise David Cameron, which, just to be clear, is not going to happen, um, what I would have done in these circumstances is say to him, look, you need to concede some failure, um, which presents a kind of sense of humility on your part, that you've learned lessons. And the reason you need to do that is you, you will deflect from what the real headline will be, which is David Cameron angrily denies austerity left Britain exposed to COVID. So come up with something where it looks like you're being humble, but it won't cause you public anger. And what David Cameron did is focus on saying, well, actually, we should have prepared more for coronaviruses rather than influenza. But a lot of people will listen to that and go, well, oh, that's interesting, he's learning lessons. Oh, good guy, well done him. But they'll think to themselves, Pff, how are they to know? <laughs> you know, was asymptomatic transmission by coronaviruses causing a massive pandemic? Was that ever something which was really highlighted by scientists as an imminent danger? The, the point I'm making is that's, that is a strategy which I think he has... I mean, I don't know if he consciously or unconsciously did it, but it definitely works because that's what the headline's focused on. But you see, the skewing of this and what we should be talking about 
given that we focus so much on Johnson. This is what David Cameron spoke about in his testimony. He spoke about how we would have ended up like Greece without cuts, which is risable nonsense. And he claimed that the cuts uh, returned the economy to health. And the, the basic argument of David Cameron and George Osborne was that by introducing their huge swinging cuts, that actually left Britain better prepared economically for any future shock, such as, for example, a uh, pandemic. That is a nonsense. So if we look at the the idea that the cuts returned the country to economic health. As economist Jonathan Portes pointed out, back then interest rates at near zero, extra borrowing had essentially no impact on long-term government rates. They could have invested money without dire consequences, but they were interested in two things. Firstly, an ideologically charged project of shrinking the British state. And secondly, to have a dividing line that would torture the Labour Party. And that was based on this myth that Labour had spent too much money and that caused the crisis, even though the Tories backed every pound of that the Labour had spent before 2008. Um, and to always position themselves as, you can trust Labour, the, the Tories with the finances, Labour will be reckless overspenders. That was the point of the exercise. Now, it was a nonsense. They didn't, uh, what they promised to do was eradicate the deficit. It never happened. They didn't get, well, they got through about half. Um, and uh, growth was terrible. The worst uh, squeeze in living standards ever. Um, certainly in modern times. Now, uh, if we look at the actual focus in terms of, if we take, you know, go beyond just austerity in the round, if you look at the NHS budget, so David Cameron said, well, actually, that, that was protected because unlike other government departments, spending on it increased. Now, this is just smoke and mirrors because as the King's Fund put it in 2015, under the Cameron Osborne government, the NHS suffered the lo lowest annual average real increase in spending since its foundation back in 1948. Um, Jeremy Hunt himself admitted last year that NHS staff shortages left the country exposed to a major health crisis. He also said that cuts to social care left the country exposed to, uh, to um, sorry, he said that uh, cuts to social care went too far, making it a silent killer. And as Sir Michael Marmot uh, put it, who is a very prominent leading epidemiologist, um, that, uh, that when you adjust for an ageing and growing population, NHS spending actually went down so you know we're not even talking that i mean we could, we could add in the top-down reorganization they did in 2012 we could talk about the real terms pay cuts year after year after year for burnt out staff these all had terrible impacts now what as phil banfield the chairman of the british medical association said the government ground down and pulled apart public health care systems until they were threadbare um now, what Cameron did is he, when presented with evidence that health inequalities worsened under his government, uh, he said that austerity wasn't responsible. Now, as Professor Marmot put it, that flies in the face of scientific uh, opinion. That's the consensus. I mean, he's essentially saying the guy's a flat earther. Now, th the reason this matters, and he, so Mar Michael Marmot pointed out that life expectancy, for example, for the poorest people actually fell under Cameron and Osborne, and that matters because COVID specifically hurt most those with underlying health conditions who were most likely to be poor and poor people disproportionately from minorities. Now we could go on, for example, inadequate statutory sick pay, the lowest of the industrialized OECD countries, was allowed to fall in real terms. Millions weren't even eligible for that. And you know, what what that meant is people often felt, well, I've got to look after my family. So even if I feel ill or going to work, so the virus spread. Economic insecurity was a breeding ground for COVID in this country. We could go on. Now, this is the point. It failed, as I've said, on its own terms. It didn't do what it said it would do. It condemned Britain to a terrible stagnation and decline. The average Britain um, was as well off as the average German in 2010. The average Britain is now 16% poorer than the average German. That's just one example. We could look at public services, how they're collapsing, infrastructure, the housing crisis. I mean, that's what that's what austerity did. But it left us exposed to this terrible, terrible shock. It didn't let us better prepared. And it is turning reality on its head. These are con artists and fantasists, and that's how they should be treated. But that's why the excessive focus on Boris Johnson, I really think, erases the role played by David Cameron and George Osborne in shredding our social fabric, leading us into a terrible situation socially and economically, but also leading us to a place where we are terribly, terribly vulnerable to what happened from 2020 onwards. And if we're going to look at the mass death and the mass illness that befell this country, 
and whether or not actually significantly fewer people could have died, then we've got to look back to what those people did to this country. I think they've got blood on their hands. I think they need to be held to account. And it's a travesty that their interrogation was so brief because it's a very, very big part of the story indeed. Please like, subscribe, do support us at patreon.com forward slash I'll see you in a bit.